Good morning. I'm Ryan Davison. Welcome to this news briefing from the 254th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Washington, D.C. We're joined today by Dr. Kelsey Sakamoto of Harvard University. He has been developing bacteria that can coat themselves in tiny solar panels and use the harvesting, harvested energy to make fuel and other useful compounds. Dr. Sakamoto? Uh, thank you. Um, and it's great to be here to kind of uh, roll out the press machine for this work and sort of an ongoing story that we've been developing. Um, and the work was carried out when I was a graduate student, a recent graduate student at UC Berkeley uh, in the lab of Pei Dong Yang. And our work, uh, as a group, we've been working in artificial photosynthesis for many years, trying to find nice ways to go from solar energy to actual chemicals. And our work pushes us towards the interface of chemistry and biology. Uh, one thing that we've realized uh, from the current state of the field is that if you want to do CO2 reduction, really it's very hard to beat biology at it. Uh, the pathways and the enzymes that have evolved for this purpose are way more efficient than anything that we've so far been able to design in the lab. And so based on this insight, we've kind of accepted that biology for the time being may be the way going forward to make chemicals from sunlight and CO2. The big drawback, though, of biology is that the light harvesting is absolutely no good. Uh, and the problem really is that plants don't absorb a lot of sunlight, uh, which is why they're that nice green color instead of sort of that dark black color of uh, silicon photovoltaic solar panels. Um, and so we've kind of tried to navigate this middle road in which we use biological CO2 fixation and combine that with uh, inorganic-based semiconductor light harvesting, as you would find in solar panels. And our work sort of began when we uh, sort of rediscovered this bacterium, Morella thermoacetica. Um, it's one that had been studied uh, maybe 20 years ago in the literature, uh, but hadn't really gone far outside of basic microbiology work. And one unique feature of this bacterium, um, in addition to doing CO2 fixation uh, through a biological cycle, uh, it has this unique, unique feature of its biology that if you give it some metal, uh, in this case, we gave it cadmium. Uh, if you give it cadmium, it'll start to precipitate out and synthesize uh, semiconductor quantum dots of cadmium sulfide, uh, which is one of the classical light harvesters uh, in the early days of photovoltaic research. Um, and quite remarkably, this wild type bacteria naturally has the ability to make these tiny solar panels and cover its body with it. And if we very simply just shine light upon this system, it's able to fix CO2 um, into acetic acid. Uh, and from that acetic acid, we sort of picked it as a, as a very, very nice starting point for solar to chemical production. Uh, there are a lot of synthetic bacteria, sort of engineered organisms, uh, that our collaborators in Michelle Chang's group, also at UC Berkeley, uh, they've designed some strains of E. coli that can take the acetic acid we produce without any purification, without any sort of further processing. And they're able to diversify that into uh, drop-in fuel replacements like butanol. Um, they also make a bioplastic called polyhydroxybutyrate, and a number of pharmaceutical compounds as well, uh, sort of demonstrating the, the great synthetic power of biology combined with this sort of hybrid uh, cyborg system. Uh, since our initial sort of discovery of this bacterium, we've been sort of very diligently following up with further studies to um, in some cases improve the performance of this bacterium to combine it with other photocatalysts to per se uh, uh, induce things like oxygenic photosynthesis to produce oxygen simultaneously. Um, but on the more fundamental science aspect, we've really been delving deep into spectroscopy to understand how these bacteria function, how they're able to basically eat electrons derived from this semiconductor. Um, and some of our recent work uh, has uncovered that it's not some sort of mysterious and magical force at play. Uh, really, it is uh, some very nice uh, charge transfer between the semiconductor itself and enzymes found on the surface of this bacterium. Um, and so now with this sort of more fundamental insight into how these systems work, uh, we've begun to not only pursue deeper into undercover sort of the basic biology and chemistry of it, but now we can begin to sort of tune and tweak the levers to optimize this interface and develop more functional systems from that. Um, I think with that, I think I'd be happy to take 
any Would, would you actually like perhaps? to uh, highlight your slides at all? Uh, sure. And so in the slides, you see sort of the cartoon version of our system. And it's, it's a very nice, simple one-step growth in which we grow our bacteria, add some cadmium, and boom, they produce these solar panels on top of their uh, outer membrane. Um, and you see in the bottom left, this is what the reactor look like, looks like. It's a tube of this yellow suspension of these bacteria covered with cadmium sulfide. Uh, so it's quite simple. It doesn't require any expensive electrodes or sort of expensive housing. Um, we kind of liken it to the microalgae field in which you can have just giant vats of this stuff uh, sitting out in the sun to produce your chemicals. Um, and on the next slide, uh, this is sort of our insight into the mechanism of this charge transfer pathway. And we started identifying the key enzymes found in this bacterium to enable this charge transfer process, um, which is sort of where we're going forward in this future work. I think now perhaps I'd be happy to take any questions. If we have any questions, uh, please state your affiliation. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry, an industry magazine. Um, I'm just interested in finding out how, um, whether there are other species that could potentially do have this same ability. And also, I think you mentioned um, bias prospecting for organisms in right. nature. Where would you actually look for this type of organism that could carry out that work? So it's, it is very serendipitous that we found this thing as a naturally occurring bacterium. and. Uh, this feature we think is somewhat conserved amongst many type of bacteria. You know, uh, this response is inherently a defense against heavy toxic metals like uh, cadmium or lead or mercury. Um, and so we suspect that there are a lot of types of bacteria are able to do this. Um, and other researchers have since shown that things like E. coli have a similar pathway they can use to detoxify these metals. Um, as for where we might find other bacteria that can do these sorts of behaviors, uh, one thing that we're quite interested in is to find other types of semiconductors that can be produced through this biosynthetic route. Um, cadmium sulfide is a great material to start with, but there's certain reasons why the photovoltaic industry has moved beyond cadmium sulfide. Um, and so really we are open, so we sort of have the targets in mind, what semiconductors would be useful, things like silicon or uh, three, five semiconductors like indium phosphide, these sort of next generation solar panel materials. Um, and to some extent, you know, this cadmium sulfide bacteria is found in nature as you're somewhat likely to encounter cadmium out in the open, perhaps more contaminated sites. Um, but for these more advanced, uh, semiconductors, really the, I think the place we would begin to look uh, is more unusual environments, not necessarily natural environments. So things like indium to make indium phosphide, indium is not really found widely in nature and it's not a big industrial process yet. Um, the way that cadmium was for like nickel cadmium batteries. Uh, so we think that you'd have to start looking in relatively unusual environments, uh, perhaps laboratories um, or things like clean rooms you find in uh, microfabrication facilities where you have a high abundance of these unnatural or less natural elements uh, suited towards semiconductor production. And wherever you find the surface and some mild conditions, you're, going, you're bound to find bacteria and yeast and fungi. And so looking in these types of more uh, common yet exotic environments, I think bioprospecting in perhaps laboratories or these environments would yield these types of bacteria that can produce more interesting semiconductors. Hello, um, Bruce Lig, the ACS Communication. Um, when you were looking for these bacteria, were you looking for something that was uh, was uh, naturally resistant to toxic metals, or were you looking for some uh, for for a bacterium will, that will detoxify toxic waste containing uh, uh, cadmium, for example? And then then the next question is. Since you can do this and make uh, make cadmium sulfide, how in, uh, very inefficient it is as a, uh, as a solar panel, but you could possibly grow solar panels on, uh, on a surface and then just put it on the roof, and then you've got uh, got basically a homegrown solar solar panel. 
Right. Um, so the way we found this bacterium is through, uh, I, I don't know if this is everyone's technique, but sort of loss of Google Scholar searching. Uh, and really it came out of a very late night idea in our lab of, you know, we've been working and trying to link a bacteria to electrodes and all these other types of inorganic materials. Um, and we kind of got fed up with and say, well, we'll just have them make it themselves and then they'll be happy with it. Um, and so it's hard to say how we found ourselves down the rabbit hole of bacteria semiconductors, um, but it is sort of a emerging field, sort of biomaterials to make uh, functional nanomaterials and sort of metallic materials as well. Um, as for sort of uh, what you might be able to do with cadmium sulfide as it is, uh, sort of one, one concern that has been raised uh, previously is, oh, you know, cadmium is kind of toxic, which is not terribly nice. Uh, but there is tons of cadmium floating around, and I would argue it's better to be contained inside of a nice reactor, perhaps sitting on uh, a rooftop, uh, as opposed to sort of floating out in the environment. Um, and to some extent, you know, cadmium sulfide does work as a very, very nice semiconductor. It's fairly efficient at light harvesting and charge transfer. Um, and with sort of a large amount of cadmium out in the environment, sort of just sequestered away so it doesn't leak out into someone's water supply, um, I think if you can uh, accept the sort of less than ideal efficiencies and scale it up in a cheap, effective way, then it has a, a, a foothold in the marketplace as a technology, not necessarily for sort of big factories, but as sort of a point of view system. Thank you, Kathy Kowalski, Freelance. Um, is the concept that once you get the bacteria to make these semiconductors, that the semiconductor is made and you're all happy? Or if I have these in a solar panel on my roof, do I have to keep feeding them? And no. I'm sorry if that sounds goofy, but. No, so that, that's a very, very valid question. And one of the big drawbacks of a lot of biological systems is that they're fairly unstable. And so people have worked with sort of purified enzymes combined with semiconductors. And those types of devices only last around maybe 10 minutes to an hour before you have to rebuild the whole thing again. Uh, the nice thing about working with whole cells, living bacteria that are autonomous and on their own is that they are self-replicating and they are able to self-repair. And so in our initial work, we were able to show that these bacteria not only do the photosynthesis to make acetic acid from CO2, but they're also self-replicating, that they can use a fraction of the energy derived from this photosynthesis to make more bacteria. And as you make more bacteria, because the original semiconductor was produced through just bacteria growing and doing their normal bacteria business, they will sort of remake the semiconductor as it degrades and falls apart. And so we haven't tested this for extremely long periods of time, uh, but we'll believe that the basic fundamental biology and the chemistry is there, that it can be a initial setup and then sort of self-replicating in perpetuity after that. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Are you interested as, as well in um, maybe engineering the bacteria to be able to make different semiconductors, more useful semiconductors? Because the potential, I guess, if you could make energy um, more safely could be enormous, I guess, for, I'm thinking of things like nanobots or making biologic drugs. Um, it could open up a lot of opportunities. So are you using sort of genetic engineering at all? Uh, we aren't currently, but that sort of is a direction we're thinking about in the future. Uh, there is always a, a big debate on whether you transfer uh, behaviors from sort of unique bacteria into sort of the workhorses of metabolic engineering, things like E. coli, or you try to turn these sort of unique bacteria into the workhorses that you'd like to use. Um, so Morella thermocetica is known and studied, but not really used as widely for synthetic biology. Um, and there has been talk about transferring this pathway from Morella, the cadmium sulfide producing pathway, into something like E. coli, in which you now have access to the full uh, toolbox of synthetic biology, and you can really do whatever you'd like. Um, and so one idea is that currently we have sort of a two-step approach in which we first do the photosynthesis to make acetic acid, and then from that acetic acid, we then give it to another bacterium that then makes all the interesting chemicals. Uh, one idea is to put everything in a single bacterium, sort of this giant omnibus of photosynthesis. 
Um, and it is an appealing target, uh, but there are some arguments raised that perhaps having this pathway distributed amongst different bacteria builds in kind of a robustness uh, for this chemical processing approach. Um, but certainly there may come a limit in which after a lot of diligent bioprospecting, we're unable to find bacteria that make the more exotic semiconductors that we'd like. Um, in which case, we do have an idea of synthetic routes, chemical reactions that to derive these types of semiconductors. And finding a way to translate a very chemical reaction into some sort of biological machinery um, is a very, very lofty target, but is one we are sort of actively pursuing uh, along those lines. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you, Dr. Sakamoto. Thank you. Very interesting research. Uh, the archived version of this session will soon be posted on bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore DC. Uh, please join us for our next press conference at 1030 today on a high-tech fabric that could keep soldiers both warm and battle-ready in frigid environments. Thank you.